You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, go to nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right-hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Hyder's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 199, Hebrews chapter 13. I'm DeLayman, Trey Strickland, and he's the scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike, how you doing this week? Oh, busy. Maybe a little more harried than usual. Uh, lots of stuff to do. and s- Some of it we'll actually mention here. I'm, I'm beginning prep for the, a conference and whatnot, and just a little mo- bit more harried than usual. Yeah, is there ever a time where you don't do anything, like where you actually just like go on vacation and do nothing or do you always fill your time with doing something? Yeah. I, I can't remember ever doing nothing. <laughs> so would your, I can if, imagine if nothing pops into my head. I guess the answer is no. I can imagine your brain would explode if it just got quiet and still, you'd probably get scared. Oh, uh, well, or I, I, yeah, I, I, I probably would. That would just be too unnerving. Or, or do you I go guess. to sleep? I mean, like me, I, I, I have a hard time going to sleep because my mind's racing. It's hard to shut my brain down. Do you have that problem? Or, or? I, I, I don't. It's like, well, I'm done now. Well, <laughs> that's good. You, you get it all out during the day, and then you can go to sleep because yeah. you've accomplished so much. Me, on the other hand, I'm just coming up with ideas and thinking all the time, so it's hard to go to sleep. Well, for 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 me, you know that that's usually when I'm in the shower or driving or something like that. So, yeah, yeah. not so much at night, which is good. Well, that's good. Yeah, and 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 in the uh, pot of coffee a day for me doesn't probably help. The caffeine situation probably does not help me. Which I know you don't have the coffee problem, but tea has lots of caffeine, but I don't know how much tea you consume in the day. But I have a caffeine problem, Mike. Well, I, I guess I'm not real surprised. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm good for four or five cups of tea a day, but it's it's nowhere near the caffeine content that I'm sure you're consuming. Well, I try to shut it down early afternoon because I know how long it takes to metabolize, and you know it's part of our problem at night and all that stuff. But anywho, <laughs> um, enough to medical report. Right. <laughs> uh, Mike, I want to remind everybody this is the last episode of Hebrews, and. We want to ask people to email me their questions about the book of Hebrews specifically. I've already received lots of questions, so we've still got a couple weeks before that episode airs. So send me your questions at tracestrickland at gmail.com. Also, we want to remind people to go get their tickets to the Spokane, Washington, the Naked Bible Seminar three-day event that you'll be doing in Spokane mm-hmm. there, uh, March 2nd through the 4th. You can get those tickets at uh, drmsh.com. Look for the Spokane event. Yeah, yeah. right-hand side is where the calendar is and everything's set up. Well, Mike, uh, any final thoughts as we wrap up the book of Hebrews here? Well, boy, yeah, it is close. <laughs> you know, 199 Hebrews 13, so we are done uh, after the day other than the Q&A. So, I think, you know, I've actually gotten some some email correspondence uh of appreciation. Uh, no no haters thus far, but um just about the emphasis on believing loyalty for so for some reason that is sort of striking a nerve with a number of people. So I think going through Hebrews and you know, as it turns out, having that be kind of a a drum that we're beating with some regularity, I think that's been useful. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think it's been a great book, and I'm excited to see what the next book is that we'll cover. Uh, After this episode, we'll have our 200th episode, which I can't believe 200. That's a big milestone. Then we'll have the Mm -hmm. Hebrews Q&A, another Q&A, then a couple of interviews and single topics. Uh, And so we're probably looking at about April, I'm going to say, before we start to vote on the next book uh, that we're going to cover. So we got some time before we Mm -hmm. get into another book. So. Yeah, yeah, it'll it'll be interesting. We'll we'll come up with, you know, we'll use some of the old ones that people voted on and toss in a new one or two and just see where where people land. So, um, you know, who knows? <laughs> I, I didn't expect Hebrews this time around, and that's we, we got a clear direction there. So, who knows what what it'll be next time? Yeah, it's been a good one, though. I'm glad they they chose it. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's let's jump into Hebrews 13 and and uh, wrap up the book here. It's, it's a, a bit of a shorter chapter. There's some uh, elements of kind of you know summation and recap and cleanup that, that that the writer's doing here, but there are a few other things that are um, I don't know if I want to say new, but little little 
excursions that he takes that are going to be worth uh, commenting on, talking about. So as we start, let's just, since it's not too long, I'm, I'm just going to read through the chapter, and then we'll go back and jump into the first verse. So again, after all, all this we've had you know, said about remaining in the faith, keep believing, you know, don't give up. Again, the, the, the persecution, you know, context, he really starts to get more pastoral, I think, in this chapter. But we're just going to read through the whole thing and then jump back and camp at a few places. So he writes, let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them and those who are mistreated, since you also are in the body. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Keep your life free from love of money, and be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, The Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods which have, been, which have not benefited those devoted to them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience, desiring to act honorably in all things. I urge you the more earnestly to do this, in order that I may be restored to you sooner. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I appeal to you, brothers, bear with my word of exhortation, for I have written to you briefly. You should know that our brother Timothy has been released with whom I shall see you if he comes soon. Greet all your leaders and the saints. Those who come from Italy send you greetings. Grace be with all of you. And that's the end of the letter. It's it's pretty obvious that, he, again, he strikes a pastoral tone here, um, you know, which you'd expect, you know, for the end of the end of the letter, the end of, you know, the whole you know thing after he's really, you know, been into a lot of deep content uh, in terms of, you know, the, what he had to cover here, what he wanted to cover. So you have the first six verses here, and again, the, the tone is really obvious. Let brotherly love continue. Well, why would you know, he even mention that? And again, it's because, you know, what did he just get done saying in the 12th chapter? You know, let brotherly love continue. You know, the context, of course, is encouraging mutual support in the face of persecution, you know, so as to help believers, people in the community endure, that is, keep believing. But the whole section here, uh, again, is just sort of peppered with kind of pastoral sorts of encouragement. So just to read through quickly, let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember those who are in prison, as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated, since you also are in the body. Let marriage be held in honor among all. Let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have, for he said, I will never leave nor forsake you. And then he goes on to say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. Again, quoting from the Old Testament. All of these exhortations uh, in general are about the community life and, and really you know, things that would either sort of threaten the solidarity of the community 
threaten the, the, the testimony of the community, in some cases just, again, aimed at getting people within the community to not, again, surrender their faith. Again, the, that, that familiar idea that we've seen so many, so many times you know, going up to this chapter. Lane has, I think, a nice summary here. I'm going to read a little excerpt from his commentary, which is the word biblical commentary. He says, uh, you, what we have here is an appeal for fraternal love, verse 1, hospitality, verse 2, an identification with those imprisoned and mistreated, verse 3, indifference to earthly possessions, verse 5, and confidence of the presence of hostility, verse 6. All this evokes the exemplary stance that the community had assumed under harsh circumstances in the past. Concurrently, it reiterates and gives specification to the exhortation to love and good works back in chapter 10, verse 24. And continuing, he says, it is important to appreciate that this was something new. In the second half of the second century, the satirist Lucian of Sam- Samosata explained to a correspondent, Cronius, that the relationship among Christians is unusual. They are to regard one another as brothers. He illustrates his point by calling attention to the Christian attitude toward material possessions and grounds in the teaching of Jesus their willingness to share what they own with one another. And then he has a quotation from this source, uh, which says, Moreover, their original lawgiver persuaded them that they should be like brothers to one another. That's a reference from this uh, from this writer, again, a, a pagan, a Gentile, to the about the Christians. And the original lawgiver, this is his reference to Jesus. Moreover, their original lawgiver persuaded them that they should be like brothers to one another. Therefore, they despise all things equally and view them as common property, accepting such teachings by tradition and without any precise belief. Now, that's the end of the quote. Lane continues, Lucian's remarks indicate that an educated person in the second century was quite unprepared for the Christian notion of Philadelphia, brotherly love, expressed in the admonition, keep on loving each other as brothers. The expansion of the term to include men and women beyond the immediate family was considered ludicrous. Ironically, Lucian's choice of the Christian attitude toward personal property to illustrate Jesus' teaching is insightful. It is precisely a willingness to share possessions unselfishly that is characteristic of the relationship among members of the same family. New perspectives concerning familiar relationships will inevitably have implications for attitudes toward personal wealth. That's the end of Lane's quote. So basically what he, what he's saying is that to the you know to to the people of of this time period kind of looking at Christian behavior they thought it was a little bizarre because they 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 did typically they engaged in behavior that was typically reserved for immediate family members, uh, and they widened it to non-family members in their community. And again, about you know not detaching themselves from interest in personal property and possessions, you know, so, so that they could you know share with you know fellow believers in the community, which is exactly you know what Hebrews is saying here. Uh, that would have you know people looked at that at the time and thought that's just crazy. And it's not like everybody's dressing in white sheets and, you know, selling everything off and going to the top of the mountain and waiting for the Lord, you know, for the next Harold camping experiment. You know, just that, that isn't the point. That's not why it was weird. It was weird because you treated non-family members the way you would treat them as family, you know, your, your close relatives, your immediate family. That just wasn't normal. But within the Christian community, it, it, it was normal. And if we're looking, you know, if we're paying attention here, what the writer of Hebrews is saying, well, that ought to be normal. That ought to be the way that, that things are done. So back in verse one, you know, that he begins with this bro- brotherly love uh, continue, which means they, they'd already been doing it. This isn't anything new to them, you know, to the Christian community. Let brotherly love continue. Again, the context is this mutual support in the face of persecution. You, know, you, you can imagine you know, some of the issues here. You know, what if, what if you had believers, you know, falter? I mean, I, it's kind of interesting. I was, I mentioned at the intro, you know, I'm, I have my hand in a lot of projects, and one, and one of them is uh, my next round of uh, fringe pop filming. One of the things that we want to focus on is uh, it has is attached to the Nicene Creed. We'll just we'll just you know, leave it at that. But there's this, you know, if you actually go look at the at the, the canons of Nicaea, the the decisions that were were offered, it's striking how many of them are. You know, there's there's a good three, four, maybe five that have something to do with what do we do with with Christian brethren who gave up the faith in, in the face of persecution, or or even less 
you know, than that, if it, out of convenience, what, how do we treat them? What do we do with them? And you can imagine, you know, here, here in the context in Hebrews, you know, this is considered this is centuries earlier than Nicaea, obviously, but you're going to have the same kinds of issues, you know, and, and what the writer wants to continue is brotherly love. I mean, if you stick with it, you know, even if you have moments of weakness or whatever, you know, what we've talked about, like if you really bail, if you really surrender the faith, if you really go back to Torah or, or nothing at all, you know, it, then it, it's really difficult, you know, for you to come back to the gospel having once abandoned it. But, you know, let, let's say that happened to somebody. Let's say that they came back to the faith or let's say that they had some other lapse. Uh, again, that was lesser, but still something that you know would have been frowned upon by the community. You know, the writer here is saying, "Look, you know, brotherly love continue. You got to stick together in these things." You know, in other words, the opposite would be looking for occasions to pick at each other, looking for occasions to fault one another. It, it's precisely the opposite of what what he wants them to do. And then he says, "Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares." Now that this shows a little bit about uh, you know, broadly, it, it's like, you know, hey, don't refuse hospitality to anyone because you never know. There's there's that feeling to it, and and you know, he's drawing on obviously Old Testament precedent. The most, you know, the immediate reference here is going to be Genesis 18 and 19, where you have the Lord and you know two angels show up. They they appear as men to Abraham and Sarah. You know, again, it's a very familiar story, and and he had no idea, you know, until, in fact, if you read through, through Genesis 18, that Abraham has an inkling of who he's talking to. But we only find out from the writer uh, of Genesis that, that the other two were angels when you get to chapter 19, and Abraham's not in that scene, you know. So it it has this feel of he, he just, he didn't know until, you know, after the fact. So there's that. That's why you should be hospitable. But, you know, if we read verse 2 right after verse 1, it's just it's a general truism. You know, you're supposed to be hospitable uh, to strangers. You know, I, I it's a way of expressing the kind of brotherly love he wants in the first verse because you also don't know whether they're believers or not. And even if they're not believers, well, that's good because then you can show them you know how believers behave by showing hospitality. So it, it, it's not just sort of a random um, hey, let's stick in a thought about angels here. I mean, it it, it it's consistent with what what it follows and what what's going to you know be said later on. You know, there are other you know instances where besides Genesis eighteen nineteen where he might be thinking of. I mean, we're we're familiar with these. There there are people in the Old Testament that run into uh, angels or the angel of the Lord and don't quite know what what's going on, what they're dealing with. You have Gideon in Judges six. You've got Samson's parents uh, in Judges thirteen. One one of the more striking ones is is actually outside uh, the Protestant canon. That's the Book of Tobit, uh, which you know they they were probably familiar with because they're familiar with the Septuagint. Uh, I, I still think that what the writer of Hebrews is, you know, angling for here is Genesis 18, 19, 19 but in Tobit, you have a sort of a, a famous episode where you have a person, uh, Tobias, who's the son of Tobit, you know, uh, being accompanied by an angel, you know, on, on, on a mission or a task and doesn't know it until the very end. Uh, you even have this ironic scene where the angel, uh, you know, <laughs> bids Tobias and and uh, a companion, you know, uh, a good trip, you know, like, you know, maybe an angel will greet you on the way and you'll have a safe trip. Well, he, he is one, you know, it, it's kind of a humorous, you know, sort of thing. So they, they might've been thinking of that, but I think probably the best bet is, is typically, you know, Genesis eighteen nineteen. Let's go down to verse four. We're just going to hit some things that, as we go through the, the passage, we're not going to comment on everything. We, we, again, this is our typical approach, you know, whatever seems to be interesting or worth commenting on. We have a comment here that is uh, interesting. And I think that, that is worth bringing up in light of a lot of the content we've talked about before in the whole book uh, about salvation by faith and believing loyalty and whatnot. We get to verse four and it says, let marriage be held in honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Now you're going to have some people that, and again, we've had last episode in chapter 12, we had, you know, certain things said in the chapter that people are going to hop on and, they're going to say, well, you know, well, look at this behavior. This surely this has something to do with salvation. You know, again, making making moral behavior part of salvation, either unintentionally because that's just sort of the way we're tuned, you know, to think by preaching. We've heard, or something a little bit, I think, more more sinister that that you've got a, a redefining of the gospel with with intent behind it. But here's another one of these. You know, well, well, surely the you know the writer wouldn't bring this up unless it has something to do with salvation, or you would assume that that the judgment here he's talking about has something to do with with a person's eternal destiny. Passage never says that. 
of course God is going to judge sin. Okay, you know, be sure your sin will find you out, you know, that kind of thing. Of course God is going to judge sin, unbelievers and believers alike. You know, but sexual morality isn't the gospel. It's it's not an element. It's not a component of the recipe, if we can say that, for eternal life. The recipe for eternal life is believe. Believe the gospel. You're, that salvation is based upon not what you do or what you abstain from, but what's, what someone else did for you, namely Jesus on the cross. So, you, you, yes, God will judge sin. You will reap what you sow. There are consequences for sin. But the comment here is, is more about you know, the consequences. It's not about moral achievement unto salvation. Again, we, we get caught in this trap because of the way we, we hear some of these things preached. And I think, again, it's just another reminder. It, of course, God is going to take sin seriously. Of course, we should live you know, a, a holy life. We should, we should not you know, be bad testimonies and self-destructive and, and sort of you know, flipping God off with the way that, that, that we live. You know, we, we should live you know, a holy life out of gratitude for what has been done for us. And again, to avoid self-destruction and destroying the lives of others. You know, there, there's, again, there are lots of reasons why we should live a certain way. One of those is not so that we achieve enough merit to qualify for salvation. Okay, that's just not the gospel. Let the marriage bed be undefiled. Another thing I think is worth mentioning here. The point of the statement is to remain faithful to your spouse. Uh, as opposed to an endorsement of, hey, do anything you want in bed with your spouse. I mean, I, I've, I've never actually heard people, like in a, in a sermon, take it that way. I have kind of heard it in, in conversation. First Corinthians 7 is actually more appropriate yeah, for a conversation about that sort of thing. Um, you, you can go look up the passage. I'm not going to read the passage here. But the point here is not just sort of this, you know, endorsement of, you know, whatever you're curious about. It, it's, look, remain faithful to your spouse. Be faithful to your spouse. Remain faithful. Verse 5, keep your life free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. As, you know, again, we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not feel. What can man do to me? Again, th this is very germane, again, to the context, what, you know, what he's been talking about, especially the situation that the, a lot of them are in. Well, you know, why, why get into money and being content? You know why get into you know being faithful to your spouse and, and and so on and so forth. You know it. You you want to you want to honor the Lord. You know with your with your ethic. You know with your behavior. Again, not to 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 you know pile up brownie points so, of merit so that you'll qualify for salvation. You know you you want to do this for the sake of the community, so that the community isn't struggling with sin within the community and then fighting about what you know, with each other about what to do about this or that and you you want to do it for the sake of the community you want to do it for the sake of gratitude you know for what the lord has done for you all these things we mentioned before this one again get gets into that and in a more practical way because it, it just applies more broadly again make sure you you know you you share what you have it, it's a simple idea you know, he's not saying it to make sure that believers, Christians, don't have too much fun. You know, stay, you know, fr free your life from the love of money. We don't want you to have too much fun. No, and it's really not even to to prevent excess. You know, don't don't earn too much. You know, it, it's not even that. It, it, really, the point is, don't rely on your own resources and make sure that you share your resources. Be willing to part with with what you have for the good of other believers, because some of them, frankly, are just going to need it. They're just, you know, again, you go back to chapter 10, earlier places in the epistle, they've, they have, you know, suffered loss, they've had their property taken, other references to different kinds of persecution. Some of them are just going to need what you have, and you ought not give it a second thought. You ought not love it too much that you hang on to it at the expense of someone else, of another believer. And that's really what he's getting at. It's not, it's not some sort of, you know, diatribe. And this, this is sort of a, pet peeve of mine, but people will take, you know, statements like this or, you know, Acts 2 and those, well, this is an endorsement of, you know, socialism or communism, or it's a jab against capitalism, you know, having to, you know, ha having a, you know, over a certain amount. It's not that at all. Okay. Th th what he, he, the writer's not thinking about political theories about wealth creation or self-reliance or empowering the state over the individual. It's just not in the picture at all. It's much more practical. The point is love for those in the community because they're just going to need it. 
you're going to have people who need what you have and you're, you're the stopgap for them in, in, in the times being what they are in the circumstances we're all in. Don't get so attached to these things. And then even more so don't rely on them, you know, even for yourself, because the Lord has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You know, what can man do to me? Again, this is why he quotes these Old Testament passages. Don't get too attached to them yourself, you know, because the tables could be turned and you would be the one in need. Uh, again, you never know because of the of times being what they what they were in the epistle, in the context of, of what he's writing. In verse 7, he says, remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. What's interesting here, at least to my eye, is it doesn't say consider their way of life. It says, consider the outcome of their way of life. Now, there, there are a couple possibilities here. I think they're all interesting as far as, you know, what what might, you know, be going on here? What what might be the writer's, you know, sort of what he's angling for here? Uh, the word is ekbasis, which can really be translated to, to sort of go on three trajectories. It can refer to the end point of a, of a duration uh, like the, you know, the 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 end of a of a process, or the end of of some something that's been ongoing, and, and if you look at it that way, you know, then then the writer would be saying, well, consider how their life ended. You know, your leaders. You know, consider how how you know your your leaders' life ended. In other words, they remained in faith, and therefore imitate them, imitate their faith. That that could be what his point is. Secondly, it could be uh, referring to the specific outcome of an event or, or, or state of being. These are all from BDAG, by the way. Uh, if that's what we're supposed to think, then essentially what, what the writer is saying is consider how, again, with respect to your leaders, consider how their situation turned out. In other words, to consider how God met their needs, you know, how, the outcome of it. They endured, they kept the faith, and, and the Lord delivered them. You know, consider you know, how their situation turned out and therefore imitate their faith. You know, imitate them. Third, it, it could refer to the way out specifically of some difficulty, uh, the actual you know way out. If that's what we're supposed to think think about here again, the writer would be saying, consider how the solution that God provided, consider what what that was. You know, think about how how God got them out of that situation. You know, consider the the things that God used to deliver them, and then imitate their faith, realizing that God can do the same for you. I mean, it, it, you know, my guess is we don't have to land anyone place here, that, that all of these things are in play. But I just thought it was interesting that he doesn't say, consider the their, their faith or their way of life, excuse me, consider their way of life. It says, consider the outcome of their way of life. So either it points to a happy ending, you know, and, and again, God was in that and God can do the same thing for you, or it could be a, 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 a terrible ending, you know, that, that maybe they, they died under persecution, but but they never recanted. They never gave up the faith. And he's already talked about previously in the letter that, especially Hebrews 11, that what's awaiting them is far superior to what they were, you know, the life they had here. So it could be any of these things. It's just kind of interesting, you know, language and interesting way of expressing that. Let's go down to verse 9. He says, and here he gets into some familiar territory. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods which have not benefited those devoted to them. We have an altar. You know, we have an, our own altar. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent, reference probably to priests, have no right to eat. Again, we, you know, we're, we're on the Lord's side here. We're on the side of, of, of the work of, of, of Christ. We're on the cross side here. And if you're doing that other thing over there, that Torah stuff or, you know, some, you know, ritualistic dependence, well, then you're just not on the right side. You know, you we have our own altar here, the one that you know, was the cross, from which those who are serving, the, you know, in, serving in the tent, you know, they're they're doing the, the Torah stuff, uh, to, to, you know, thinking they're going to merit salvation. They they don't they they don't have a right to be at our altar, you know, to eat from our altar. Again, he's using the the language of sacrifice here for the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. You know, we're our own altars out there. It's outside the camp. It's something totally, utterly different than the Torah language here. Now, that, that there's, there's some discussion here among commentators about diverse and strange teachings. 
if you take the the line there in verse 9 and sort of consider it with the next three verses, 10, 11, and 12, and you get the some pretty clear Torah, tabernacle, sacrificial kind of kind of language that, that harkens back to the Old Testament. It seems to be speaking pretty clearly of Judaizing. Uh, the, the, the stuff that, that shows up in verses 10, 11, and 12 is really too specific to Judaism uh, for that not to be the case. You know, some argue that at least this verse might be about something outside Judaism, like asceticism, something non-Jewish. And, and again, verse 9 could be diverse and strange teachings, but it's the concatenation of verse 9 with 10, 11, and 12 and all this pretty clear you know, Judaism stuff that uh, makes most commentators gravitate toward, you know, he's, he's really targeting, again, the, the, the Judaizing, Judaistic element that they've, they're having to contend with. So uh, Luke Timothy Johnson has a little, a little uh, excerpt here that I want to share with you. I think it's, a, it's worth reading and pointing out. He writes, what sort of teachings are these and who is propagating them? This historical judgment is made difficult by the multitude of possibilities. The only specific Dale is the noun broma in the plural foods, which I have translated dietary laws he, in his commentary. That's the way he translates it. Because of the context of teaching that's mentioned and because the author speaks of some walking in them, a concern for dietary rules together with a mention of those who worship in the tent, skene, again, the tabernacle, suggests that some form of contemporary Jewish practice and ideology is enticing some of the hearers. Can we be more specific? Does concern for dietary regulations here stand as synecdoche for a commitment to the covenant of law? In other words, is Paul taking this one sort of element and then expanding it out to the, to the whole Torah? We know that disputes, this is continuing with Johnson now, we know that disputes over the eating of certain foods divided some early Christian communities with Jewish membership. And he references Mark 7, Acts 10, Acts 11, 1 Corinthians 8 through 10, Romans 14 for some examples. Or does foods here have specific reference in the sharing of food offered in sacrifice? Paul uses language similar to this in 1 Corinthians 9, where he, 9 13, where he says, Do you not know that those who perform the temple service eat what belongs to the temple, and those who minister at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings? Our author also continues, We have an altar from which those who worship in the tent have no right to eat. And so, you know, Johnson's point here is that maybe maybe it was a specific you know element of Torah. Maybe it's just Torah in general. We don't really know, but he gives the possibilities there. Again, it's it has a very Judaistic flavor because of verses ten through twelve. Even though the comment in verse nine, you know, could be could include Gentiles, could include something else like that. So I I tend to land you know with with the majority here. Again, the, what what happens in verses ten through twelve to me really orients our mind and intentionally to having a, a problem with, you know, certain elements of, you know, Judaizing, you know, having, trying to draw people back into the, the pre-cross or non-cross position uh, of Judaism. So, you know, what, what, again, this is a familiar, you know, kind of, kind of issue. And I think what we need to, you know, think a little bit more about what this sort of thing meant to the audience. I mean, we, we look at this and it's like, good grief, you know, like who cares what, what the Judaizers would say? Let them just sort of take their ball and go home. You know, why would this even attract, why would this even trouble people who had embraced the cross? You know, if they run into, again, uh, people who are insisting on all this Torah stuff, you know, again, the implication is for salvation or as the, the way of salvation. You know, why, why would that even trouble them? Well, those things, I mean, if, if they came out of that context, then what they are not doing, the things they are rejecting in favor of, of clinging to the, the cross event, they're being told that, that these things are actually the tickets to eternal life. And so it, it, it might be, again, if you grew up with that, that that really that does trouble you because it's like, what if I'm wrong? You know, what, what if these things really are the tickets to eternal life and I'm cut off from them and I'm, you know, deliberately, you know, not going down, you know, not, not doing these things. I, I'm deliberately forsaking, you know, what Moses taught, you know, all, all these kinds of thoughts. Uh, I, I think it, you know, for, for those of you who might remember your history of civ class, or maybe uh, you put a little, little study into church history. To me, this is sort of akin to like the medieval Catholic church 
where they would put people, they, they would excommunicate people all the time. They would put na whole nations under what under what was called interdict. That was like if the king didn't do what the pope wanted, he would put his country under interdict. That means everybody in your country is excommunicated. You're cut off from things like you know communion, from the Lord's you know supper, from the Eucharist. Uh, there, there were cases where they couldn't even get married. You know, and you say, well, who, you know, who, again, who gives a rip? Well, they they naturally gave a, gave a rip because. In the in you know, the Catholic Church, marriage was a sacrament. You know, you, the Eucharist is certainly an issue. You couldn't get your kids baptized. The, basically, if you were put under interdict, you were cut off from the means of grace. That was how it was used in in, in medieval times as a tool, a political tool uh, that, that the Church you know wielded rather effectively uh, in a number of contexts. Uh, some pretty famous historical episodes because. It, if you're putting yourself out there as the source of grace, the means of grace, and then you cut people off from those things, you're not going to do mass for them anymore. You're not going to – your priests aren't going to do baptisms for you know, in that country anymore. You're, you're, the, the people are effectively cut off from heaven. They are cut off from eternal life. If they buy into that system, then you, you know, you're, you're basically toast. You don't really have an alternative because the, the, the church is telling you that if you want eternal life, these are the things you have to do, and we're the ones who do them. We're the only ones that are authorized to do them. So when we say jump, you should say how high. Otherwise, you're just cut off. So, I mean, it, the situation is kind of akin you know, to, the, to the Judaizing threat. If, if you came from this sort of background where we're, well, we're Jews. We're elect. You know, we have circumcision. We have, you know, the, the the Torah. We have, you know, this, that, and the other thing. You know, that that we're supposed to do now, to uh, you know, honor the, the true God. You know, and, and so on and so forth. And you know, what if if you have some of those people coming back to you and telling you, look, if you don't, you know, like get rid of this Jesus talk, this Jesus thing, you don't come back to to this, you're done. I mean, you're you're done because we are the we we are God's people. We are Yahweh's people. This is what your Old Testament is about. And if you're not part of us, you're not gonna you're not gonna be with the Lord when you die. I mean, this is salvation right here. And so, if again, if you were used to that, if you grew up with that, it's going to have meaning. And it is there is going to be a pull there. It is going to be a serious thing to think about. You are going to sort of check your thoughts. You know, like oh boy, what if you know, am I making the right decision? And so it, it was a serious. You know, sort of thing, and, and and the writer of Hebrews again is trying to remind them again. He's just spent twelve chapters talking about the superiority of Christ and how the Old Testament leads to Christ. How how the old what, what was what God was doing in the Old Testament led up to this point, this person, this sacrifice, and the, and and he's gotten into the into the logic, you know, the rationale of why it's superior. He's even referenced the historical event, the cross and the resurrection, you know, to validate it. Um, he spent 12 whole chapters telling them, again, that, that what they have is so much better because he needs to do that. Because not only do they have you know, enemies of different varieties, they've got one special sort of problem here going on. Um, again, this, this Judaizing element, trying to get them to, to give up their faith and come back you know, to a, a merit-based you know, system of, of Torah. And if that was their original context, you know, you, you better believe that, that that's, you know, again, that, that's going to be a troubling conversation, a troubling thing to think about for a lot of them. So he keeps returning to these points, and here he does it again, you know, in the last chapter. You get to verse 14, even what follows, again, smacks of this Torah stuff. He says, for here we have no lasting city. And writer reminding them, you know, we, we, don't, we don't have anything here, you know, that, that, that's going to be eternal. But we seek the city that is to come. Through him then... Let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Interesting, he goes back to the name theology. If you want, you want to acknowledge the, the, the name of the Most High, you're with us. You're not, you're not doing the Torah stuff, okay? You're with Jesus. You do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Now, this, this mimics Micah you know, 6, 8, which the, the whole point of that passage is not Hey, you know, let's make sure we do enough sacrifices and do them right. It's to love mercy, to do justice, you know, to walk humbly, you know, with your God. It's, it's really matters of the heart. And he's just said in chapter ten, you know, about how the blood of bulls and goats couldn't forgive, you know, moral, real, genuine moral transgressions. 
it, by your own system, you, those things aren't covered because they were abominations. They were punished with death or exile. You know, where was the sacrificial benefit there? You know, I, I, again, he all these things, you know, should be sort of in the mind of the reader, in the mind of the hearer, if he, if, if he or she heard this being taught. And, and the writer here is turning the sacrificial language right back on its head because he's quoting the Old Testament. And, you know, he uses the, the, the Micah 6, 8, you know, idea of what God really wants, what, what, what real, the sacrifices that really please God are, uh, are, you know, these things, you know, to, to love mercy, do justice, walk humbly with your God. It's not doing rituals. And again, that's going to dovetail into the whole conversation that they, they've had about Jesus offering himself as a sacrifice as the superior high priest. And this one is the one you need to align yourself with. And you don't have to worry about other sacrifices. Not only did, were a lot of them you know, not even any good for certain problems in the Old Testament, not only would you have to keep doing them every day and every week and every, you know, you just keep repeating the process, you keep hitting the reset button. Not only that, but they, they, even if you did everything perfectly, it just didn't cover all the bases. You know, how much better do we have here with one, you know, sacrifice, one high priest who, who is, you know, God. Remember, we're starting back in, in Hebrews 1, you know, all the way that, ways that Jesus was described there is the radiance of his glory, the apagosma and all that. This one in, in you know, chapter 10, having a conversation with God, again, that, that inter-Trinitarian conversation about, you know, agreeing that I'm going to go, I'm going to become a man, I'm going to sacrifice myself to accomplish what the law couldn't do. You have all of that. So don't be threatened by this sacrifice talk, this jibber-jabber about ritual. Okay, you, What you have is better than that because the, 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 the person in charge of all that in the Old Testament told you know, Jesus, I prepared for you a body. Now go down and be faithful. And because of your faithfulness, all these other things will be taken care of. You know, th this will be the promise of eternal life through you. And Jesus does that, and he sits at, down at the right hand of God. Mission accomplished. I mean, how many times has, has Hebrews said that, used that phrase? Sat down at the right hand of majesty, and all that sort of stuff. It's done. So we don't want to hear about this jibber-jabber about food laws and sacrifices and feasts and festivals, you know, the whole ritual system. Again, he's trying to, to remind them of that what they have is just so much better. In verse 17, he says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning. And don't make it a burden for them, for you know, that would be of no advantage to you. you know, basically, if, if, if you make this hard for your leaders, well, that doesn't really foster good relationships, does it now? Again, you, you, you want them to care for your souls, keep watch over your souls, and you want them to to enjoy what they do and, and take joy from it. You don't want, you know, want it to be a burden because that, again, how, how's that going to help anybody? Now, you, you, the, the, the term here, you know, for, you know, this, this submission, uh, you know, this, so this obedience language and submission is really about yielding authority, yielding your, your authority to, to someone else or yielding to someone's authority. Again, submit, you know, kind of captures that, but, I think it's worth pointing out that it it it, it does involve you know yielding to someone else. Now, Guthrie uh, has a I think a, a nice little segue here, a nice little summary of this. He writes: the writer is concerned only about attitudes and mentions two which are complementary to each other: obey and submit. The latter word occurring only here in the New Testament. This is the one about yielding authority. And Guthrie says, the function of the leaders is described in general terms as keeping watch over your souls. The same verb is used in Ephesians 6.18 in an injunction to keep alert in prayer. The task of the overseers is to maintain constant watch over those committed to their care. This is reminiscent of Paul's care of all the churches, 2 Corinthians 11.28, and of Peter's injunction to the elders to tend to God's flock, 1 Peter 5.2 which is itself reminiscent of the words of Jesus to Peter in John 21, 15, you know, feed my sheep and all that. It is noticeable, Guthrie continues, that the writer here uses the word for souls to describe people, for this is more vivid than saying you, you guys. The office of leader is recognized as one of responsibility for those who hold such office will be expected to give account of their work. It is important to note that those who exercise authority must also accept 
responsibility for their actions. Now, I think all that's important because it's not we, – we shouldn't read what he's saying here, what the writer is saying as sort of like uh, something that oh, – I'm, I'm saying this just you know for the people in charge. They'll like that. No. Uh, he, he's not asking people to sort of blindly – um, you know, s submit either because the the reason they're supposed to uh, obey their leaders is because the leaders have care over their souls, and if the leaders aren't really caring for their souls, then again, by definition, then the very logic, the very rationale for you to yield to their authority goes away. And this isn't just about blind obedience, no matter what they're doing, what they're you know set of nonsense they're asking you to do. It's not what it's about. It's about you know, it has context. Okay, the context is care for your soul. And that is why you should yield to them. And not only that, but they are going to be held accountable for that you know, by God. So it's really, it, it's, a, it's a request. It's an admonition, a little bit of that. It's a warning, uh, kind of all rolled into one. It's not just sort of this, this command, you know, to blindly obey no matter what, you know, the guy telling you that I'm your leader, you know, listen to me, no matter what, what they're telling you to do. Again, all of these things have, have context. The author, you know, is really, again, you know, not, not just saying things, you know, to, to say them, not just saying things that, that we ought to take. And again, sort of ignore the context. I mean, again, I, I'm harping on this a little bit because, you know, well, let's just face it. You know, there there are those out there in leadership, individuals, groups, uh, even movements that really define your fitness for salvation or for sanctification. Salvation would be the worst scenario, but they, they really define a believer's maturity and fitness and, and really evaluate your whole testimony by how blindly you submit to them. That is not the point. The submission has a context, and there will be a price to pay if it's abused. So if you're the one who needs to yield to authority, hold, you know, help your leaders. Help your leaders by holding them accountable that, yeah, yeah I'm glad to submit to your authority because I can tell from the way you, you, you treat us, your own testimony, the way you conduct your own life, that you really have care over our souls. You're really concerned about our, our spiritual well-being. And so, you know, we will gladly do that. We'll, we'll make it a joy, you know, for you to, to, to be our leader and not a burden, not just nitpick, you know, everything, you know, that we may not understand because we know you have our best interest in mind and we can tell. But again, hold leadership to the context of what's being said here for. It's not about blindly, oh, that's right, I forgot, you you have this title after your name. And so, even though you know what 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 you're telling me to do is kind of harebrained and and I can't really see it in scripture it's coming out of your mouth so I better obey that isn't the point uh, verse 18 he says pray for us for we are sure that we have a clear conscience desiring to act honorably in all things i urge you the more earnestly to do this in order that i may be restored to you sooner now this language here and some of what follows actually here we are at the end of the letter but if you remember you know early the the really the first episode that we talked about you know launching into this one of the uh one of the proposed authors is Paul and and so this is this is a passage and again a little bit of what follows that i mentioned it maybe two or three times you know going through the book there there are these little things that make people gravitate toward thinking about Paul being the author again i'm, I'm not persuaded of that but I want to bring some of them up and just just talk a little bit about them because it's you, you hit this and you can't you know Paul's written, written so much in the New Testament you you sort of hear his voice a little bit you know in some of what follows and so it yeah that, that's true but it's not that simple so he says I urge you more earnestly to do this in order that I may be restored to you the sooner right away we think of Paul being in jail is that really the context. Now, Luke Timothy Johnson again comments here. He says, throughout the composition, the author has used the plural when speaking of himself, that, that we may, you know, this may happen to us and we and so on and so forth. And here he does it again in verse 18. Pray for us that we, you know, for we are sure we have a clear conscience. Then he switches in verse 19 you know, to, the, to the more personal, you know, I. But Johnson says again, in, throughout the composition, he's used the plural when speaking of himself. And does so again in a request for prayer, such as we may find in Romans 15.30, Colossians 4.3. These are all Pauline epistles. 1 Thessalonians 5, 
25, 2 Thessalonians 3, 1. The us could include companions of the author, but the immediate shift to the first person in verse 19, singular, suggests that the request is for the author himself. Here it clearly implies the author was formerly part of their community life. Thus, he was able to recall for them their own earlier experiences and efforts in chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, chapter 6, 9 through 12, and then chapter 10, 32 through 34. So it would, you know, what, what Luke Timothy Johnson is saying here is, yeah, you know, this, this sounds kind of Pauline, but it's, it's probably better read because he addresses them in the first person right after, you know, this we talk. Uh, it's, it's, it's probably somebody who was part of their own community. So can we really, you know, say that, 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 that Paul fits this bill? I mean, what evidence do we have of that? And of course, the answer is, well, we don't really have anything conclusive. In, in that regard. Now, Hagner chimes in here, and he says, in light of the author's confidence in being able to visit the readers expressed in verse 23, we'll get to that in a moment, we probably can rule out imprisonment. So he doesn't think the author himself was in prison unless he is about to be released. In any case, still, something still hinders him from coming to the readers, and he urges them to the more earnestly pray for him. Now, let's go down and look at Verse verses twenty three. We're gonna we're gonna skip a couple of verses here and go to verse twenty two, and we'll come back and hit the other ones briefly. But this this note here about at the end of the epistle. Let me just repeat it for for you. Let me scroll down here when he says again, pray for us. You know, I urge you the more earnestly to do this that I may be restored to you the sooner. Again, we we sort of read imprisonment into that. We read Paul into that, and and what we've what we've looked at so far it just says well. It, doesn't really say that, doesn't really have him in jail. You know, we don't really know. But when you get down to verse 22, it says this. He's writing in the first person again. I appeal to you, brothers, bear with the word of my exhortation, for I have written to you briefly. You should know that our brother Timothy has been released, with whom I shall see you if he comes soon. Greet all your leaders and all the saints. Those who come from Italy send you greetings. Grace be with all of you. So now, now this, you could, you could very easily read that and say, well, this must be Paul. You know, he, you know, he must have been in jail. He must have been in jail with Timothy. He's writing from Italy, Rome. There we go. You know, that kind of thing. Well, if you, let's look at what it actually says. I appeal to you, brothers, bear with, with my word of exhortation, for I have written to you briefly. You should know that our brother Timothy has been released. Now, he, he doesn't actually say that they were together in jail. He just says, hey, I heard Timothy is, is really, got released. With whom I shall see you if he comes soon. Now, that, that would suggest he's not in jail. That would suggest that he's expecting, now that Timothy's been released, to meet up with him and then go see the recipients of this letter. And that's typically how it's taken, that, that the writer here himself is not in jail. He knows Timothy, or at least you know, probably has a... You know, you, we can't be sure that he knows him personally, but again, by reputation, maybe I mean, it could go either way. Um, greet all your leaders and all the saints. Those who come from Italy send you greetings. Now, maybe he'd received a group from Italy who sent greetings. Maybe he's in Italy. We don't actually know. So again, I, I just wanna, wanted to spend a few moments on this because we can't really nail down Paul here, even with the Timothy talk, even with the, hey, I'm going to you know, I, I'm, I'm going to you know come and see you now, and you know that Timothy's got a jail. We, we can't quite really get to, you know, this being Paul in prison with Timothy. And frankly, we don't even have a record of, of Timothy and Paul being in prison together. Uh, we do have a ref, reference here that you know something happened to Timothy, but when it comes to you know Paul's own, the, the, the chronicling of Paul's own life, we don't really get you know anything that that specific. So we can't really nail it down as far as that. So that's more of a point of curiosity. Now, I want to skip back again to verse 20. Now, may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, and through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, the author's own prayer, again, this is Luke Timothy Johnson again, he says, his own prayer begins with a wish. It's in the optative mood. Now, for those of you who have a little Greek, optative in, in New Testament Greek is pretty unusual. There aren't that many of them. It's the mood that expresses a, a wish or desire. There, Greek can do that in other ways besides the optative, but specifically optative forms do this. So again, he's, he's, he begins here, his little final benediction, by expressing 
a wish here. May the God of peace equip you know you, so on and so forth. And then he extends that wish to himself. You know, he he includes him himself in it. May the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, so on and so forth, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight. So he includes himself in it too. Now, some commentators have noticed the word equip here because it's not, um, it's kind of interesting that he would pick this word uh, as opposed to something else. Johnson says this, the verb, it's katartidzane, is not haphazardly selected. The author uses it for the fashioning of the world through God's word in Hebrews 11.3. Use the same verb. And even more pertinently, for the, quote, fitting, unquote, of the son with a body through which he can do God's will in Hebrews 10.5. The connection between Jesus and the hearers is thereby once more affirmed. So let me just stop there. Johnson is saying he, the author picks this verb, you know, may you know, the God of peace you know, equip you, you know, do, the, do this to you, knowing that they would, they, you know, their, their, their ear would pick up on the fact that he used the same verb to talk about the creation of the world and, and fitting Jesus with a body, the fitting the second person with a body. And, and by doing that, he again sort of aligns the believers with Jesus and God's you know creative power that sort of thing. The connection back to, to Johnson he says the connection between Jesus and the hearers is thereby once more affirmed and is reinforced by the phrase to do His will in every good thing. For it was said of Jesus that He was given a body precisely quote to do Your will, O God unquote. Back to Hebrews ten again. The author also made clear in Hebrews 10.36 that the people of faith needed to have endurance in order to receive the inheritance by, quote, having done the will of God, unquote. The human response of Jesus to God in obedient faith is now to be the response of those many sons, many children, whom God is leading to glory. That's the end of the, 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 the Johnson quote. So I, I like that, that last line, that by, by using just this one verb, he gets the, the his his audience again to hear it, to listen to it, and to think about how it this this one verb choice connects them back to Jesus, connects them back to what Jesus did, how you know, how you know God made for him you know a, a body and 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 he he did that specifically so that Jesus you know would be able to accomplish salvation, that he would be faithful and do this thing, this offering of himself surrendering his life in this body. And so when when the writer prays that God would essentially do the same thing for them. Okay, you know it, it, it's the idea that God is going to do something to you to enable you to be faithful as well. And it just it just connects them back with with Jesus in, in sort of a I don't want to say cryptic because if you're if you're listening to this it was it was sort of your native language you're going to you're going to pick up on things like this. But to us it's a little cryptic. Um, but he, he connects them back to Jesus, even in that little statement about, you know, that little prayer about them. I want to say one last thing uh, before we we wrap up here. This reference to uh, Jesus at the end here. Now, may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, so on and so forth. Now, what, th- yeah, this is just me talking. This is This is interesting to me because... Typically, when we see this language, the great shepherd of the sheep, uh, we think of this pastoral scene with little lambs skipping around the field and whatnot. Oh, you know, you know and, and the shepherd is so gentle and kind, and he plays with the lamb a little bit, you know, that, that sort of thing. This is the kind of thing that goes through our, our, our mind. There's that issue. And then just listen to the verse again. Now, may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant. You, you might, reading that in English, you might wonder, well, who's the great shepherd? Is it the God of peace or is it Jesus? Which one does it refer to? Because in the Old Testament, you know, God does get talked about in this shepherd you know, language, but so does the Messiah. So, what, I mean, what, which one does it refer to? Now, it, it you know, it, its placement here, it may, makes it feel a little bit ambiguous, but grammatically, it does definitely refer to Jesus because Lord Jesus and the word shepherd are in the same grammatical case. It's the accusative case in the Greek. So we know 
specifically, he's talking about Jesus. But but think about that. God and the Messiah get talked about in the same language in the Old Testament. And so this is, again, the, the, the writer of Hebrews defining Jesus or, or casting Jesus in these roles. Again, casting him as God, casting him as the Messiah. The other thing is that this language is not intended to be peaceful necessarily and pastoral. And I'm, I'm searching for a, a better word for it, but just this sort of, you know, wonderfully, you know, happy, kind of relaxed sort of thing. Shepherd is a word that was used for kingship in the Old Testament. Second Samuel 5, 2. In times past, when Saul was king over us, it was you who led us out and brought in Israel. And the Lord said to you, you shall be shepherd of my people Israel. You shall be prince over Israel. We have the same thing going on in chapter 7, verse 7, 2 Samuel. In all places where I have moved with the people of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? This is God conversing with you know, Nathan or you know, with David through Nathan, that sort of thing. Kingship. The shepherding was one of the metaphors of kingship in the ancient Near East. Hammurabi is referred to as a shepherd of his people. You know why? Why uh, am I getting at this? I'm I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna post um, again for those who are newsletter subscribers. There's a really interesting article on Psalm 23 uh, called "King Yahweh as the Good Shepherd." It's it's really the article is really about Psalm 23 and and its connections to ancient Near Eastern kingship not just a happy little shepherd boy, but a king, okay? Uh, it's interesting. I'm going to put that in the, in the shared folder for newsletter subscribers. I think you'll, you'll find the article interesting. The, it's by Beth Tanner. But this is not, at the end of the letter, again, just some sort of effort to leave them with a happy thought. When he leaves them with this notion, okay, the Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, he, he, he's ending on a note of kingship. Okay? Whether you know whether they realize it or not, whether they need a beat in their head, because may, maybe they do, because he, we've had all this this talk about Jesus being, you know, the radiance of God's glory, and he's seated at the right hand of God, and he, he's the great high priest. He ends the thing by reminding them he's the king. So, who was king in the Old Testament? Well, it was God, and you know, and again, God, you know, picked you know human kings at some point. And he calls them shepherds, and and there are places you know where. Where you know God is is spoken of in, in this this kind of way, and you know, he he wants he wants them to realize, look, the, the the person who essentially ran the show in the Old Testament, and the Judaizers are consistently trying to get you to go back to that system. Well, the the, the person who ran the show in the, in the in the Old Testament has now, just as he did with kings in Israel, transferred his authority to this king, and this king is Jesus. This king is one, you know, who laid down his own life for you. So let's not have any talk about going back to the old system. Or do you want to obey the king or not? And what the king wants you to do, the way we define obedience to the king now, King Jesus, is to believe in him. You know, believe the gospel, believe what he's done. You know, that is how we that's how we define kingship now. That's how we you know, that that's really what what is at the heart of our faith at this point right now. So I, I think it's just kind of an interesting thought for him to sort of just right at the end, just sort of lay down and, and essentially ask his, his audience, his readers, after going through all this and all the other ways he's talked about Jesus, essentially to remind him, do we all know who we're talking about here? And then, you know, he says, you know, he, he, he goes into some, something a little, a little lighter. But this is actually a significant kind of heavy, you know, statement. You know, it's a good reminder of, of who, in fact, this person who laid down his life for you is, and that he's seated at the right hand of God on your behalf. All right, Mike, well, there we go. Can't think of a better episode 199 than to wrap up the book of Hebrews. So we certainly... Yeah, it was, it was good timing. We, we'd love to say we planned that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but we did not. Not really. No, we, <laughs> we did, did not. not. <laughs> but it worked out perfectly. So that was awesome. We appreciate you taking us through the book of Hebrews and want to briefly remind everybody, send me those Hebrews questions if you got any, and also go get your tickets to that Spokane, Washington seminar. 
Yep. If, you're, if you can make it, please, please come. Please register. All right, Mike. Well, another good book. We appreciate it. And uh, I just want to thank everybody for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com. 